I greet you in the name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, if you turn on television, it is almost as if it is glamorous to be divorced. They have television shows that you being a divorced woman is a criteria for you to join the show. And with the glamorization of divorce and being single, it's a wonder that people still want to get married. I've had several people this year come to me and ask me to do a wedding. I did one wedding in early August in the heat of the DMV, that's the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. It was 90 plus degrees when we had our little rehearsal, and that's what everywhere. It was in a vineyard. It was a vineyard in Virginia. And it was quite beautiful and picturesque, but I was thinking, you know, we could have this at the church where we have air conditioning and we could have the choir. But on the day of the wedding, and they were running a little late, the wedding pretty much happened at Sunday. And it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. The sun was going down. He looked over, he saw all those rows of grapevines. And everything was green and lush and beautiful. And I, it dawned on me why they wanted to have this wedding in the vineyard. And then I started thinking about what a vineyard really is. The purpose of a vineyard is really to have a good time. It's really to celebrate. You know, you got the agricultural piece going on, but those grapes are getting ripe. And wine is going to come from those grapes. And that wine is going to be consumed over a meal. It's going to be consumed with friends, and they'll be laughed and enjoyed. And this morning when I stand here and I look at all of you all, I see, I see a vineyard. I see all your blessings. I see God working on you and developing you. I see the weeds that have to get out the way. I see the rain and the sun and the winds coming down on you, making you better and stronger. And I see what you have to offer. I see the wine that is in your lives. I see the merriment. I see the joy. I see the friendship. I see the companionship. And that is the lens from which I approach our scripture today. In the 21st chapter of Matthew, we know that Jesus has entered Jerusalem. And he went to the temple and he tore some stuff, stuff up at the temple. And then he walked up to a fig tree. You remember the fig tree? He walked up to the fig tree to symbolize something. He looked at the figs and saw that they had not produced fruit. That they had not been doing, the tree has not been doing what it's supposed to do. And so in front of his friends and his followers and all the hangers on and the people who were trying to understand who he was, he made this bold, symbolic gesture. He said, look at this tree. You tree, you never produce anything. I say, you never produce anything again. And right then and there, the fig tree withered and died. And I believe that Jesus wanted to show them something. Because the next thing he said to them, you can do the same thing. They said, Jesus, how can we get that kind of power? He said, you can do the same thing. All you need to do is to pray. So Jesus was changing the, the theological map of the time. He was telling people that everybody, the poor, the unfortunate, the alienated, the rich, the powerful, the pious and the empires had the same ability to access God. And God would give them power. And then he walks into the temple and he's confronted by the chief priests and the elders. And he was trying to explain to them, like, you guys are trying to do the right thing, but you have to open your mind. You have to open your mind to change. So he told the story, the parable of the two sons. 
The son who said, I, the son who refused to go into the vineyard when his father asked. And then the son who said yes and didn't go. The first one changed his mind. No, Father, I will not go. But he changed his mind. Jesus wanted them to know that they had power to change their minds. They didn't have to be trapped. That they could change their minds. And I read it for today. We see Jesus has a slightly different audience. He has the chief priests, but he also has the Pharisees. You see, the chief priests, they, re they, they represented pomp and ceremony. They represented the ritual of the temple. They were the keepers of the culture of the temple. But the Pharisees represented something a little bit different. The, re the Pharisees were the holy, holy people who debated and argued the law. They read the law. They were the embodiment of the law. So these are the two groups that are not necessarily friendly with each other, the chief priests and the Pharisees. So when they approach Jesus, it's very intense. Because they're saying, hey, you're not following the law, and you're not following our culture. What are you doing? And inviting in Jesus, was this concept of the vineyard. The vineyard was the essence of the children of Israel's understanding of what God had given them. The vineyard. God had delivered them from oppression. God had given them this land of promise. It was beautiful. It was powerful. It was enriching. And we look at our first reading today, we see Isaiah in the fifth chapter. Isaiah tells us the story of the vineyard. Isaiah describes the vineyard as this beautiful thing that Israel was given for no apparent reason. It's God's creation. God came down and cleared all the stones out the way. Cleared all the weeds out the way. God went to Israel and gave them the finest grapevines on the planet. Then God dug a big hole and put in a wine bag and a watchtower. God put up tall fences to protect this vineyard. God created the vineyard. God owned the vineyard. And God placed them in that vineyard. But then, when God went back, when it was time to make the wine, all the grapes were sour. The tenants of the vineyard had not done their job. The tenants of the vineyard had not done their job. And I looked at the scripture, I'm looking at it, I'm trying to think, why? Why? God went to see the fruits of our labor, of Israel's labor. And all God wanted was to see some sweet, delicious grapes, to see some righteousness, to see some justice, to see peace in the land, to see people breaking bread and drinking wine and celebrating the goodness. But that's not what happened. And I had to wonder to myself, why? What happened? Why didn't the folks take care of what they were given? And I think that's the challenge. It was given. It was given. You see, I think that human beings, all of us, tend to take for granted things that are given free. The problem is, the greatest things that you have in your life were free. Your health, free. Your mind, free. Your spirit, free. God's love came freely and he took it for granted. A person comes into this world and all they need is to take care of their bodies and eat right. All they need to do is love their family members and do right. But we forget about all that stuff. We lay all of that free, beautiful stuff that we have to the side and we look for that other thing. You know that 
that other thing over there that's going to make us happy because this is not enough to make us happy. We need that thing over there to make us happy and we ignore our health. We ignore our relationships with each other. We ignore our relationships with God. We ignore, we ignore our spiritual development because we're seeking that other thing. That other thing. We could treat people horribly as long as we get that other thing that's going to make us happy. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? I'm talking to you. There's not one person in this room that has a perfect life. There's not one person in this room who isn't struggling with something, myself included. We ignore our blessings. We mistreat the vineyard of our minds and our spirits because God gave it to us freely. Then Jesus, talking to the Pharisees who represent the law, and talking to the chief priests who represents the culture of the temple, he looked at them with this understanding of the vineyard in his mind, and he retold this allegory. He said there were tenants who had that beautiful vineyard. You know, the vineyard with the grapes growing up, 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 up the hills, with the beautiful vegetation, with all the stones removed and all the weeds gone, and that big vat in the middle for the wine. Those tenants, when it was time to yield their produce, and the owner sent the slaves, what did they do to the slaves? They killed them. prophet after prophet. They killed them. prophet after prophet who were called to tell them to do right, to be just, to be righteous, were killed and killed and killed because they didn't want to hear it. Then the parable continues. Then he sent the son, and they killed the son also. God is looking for us to have this big, beautiful party filled with wine and laughter and friendship and the love of families. But a lot of folks don't want to hear it. You know, brothers and sisters, I want you to take this away. That you are sitting on a vineyard that you and yourselves are that vineyard. You gotta take care of yourselves. You gotta take care of your minds. Be careful what you let into your minds. You have to take care of your spirits. Be careful what you let into your spirit. You have got to take care of your body. Be careful what you do with your body. All of these things were given to you freely. You did nothing to deserve it. You did nothing to earn it. But it's the most precious thing that you could possibly have. And all these people in your lives, good, bad, or indifferent, you have the ability to change those relationships. You have the ability to make things better. And only you do. That's what Jesus came to tell them. But the Pharisees, and the chief priest did not want to hear these things. You know, I can imagine that the Pharisees were so busy debating the law and studying the law and arguing the law that many of them forgot to manifest the law. You know, I bet you know plenty of people who know scripture left and right, backwards and forwards, can quote it at the drop of a dime, but do not manifest it in their lives. That's what Jesus is saying to us. That no matter how much you know, you have to show it. You have to manifest it. You have to be it. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this big party where we invite people into. But after you take care of yourselves, after you get your mind right, 
and your spirit right, and your body's right, you've got to share. You've got to share. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is invitational. It's bringing folks in and embracing them. It's sharing this good news. We live in a world filled with fear. And I, when I get in the pulpit, I don't talk about all that scary stuff on the news because you know it already. But I got an idea. I have an invitation for you all. I'm inviting us all this week and next week to do a special offering for the folks who are fighting Ebola, wherever they are. I'm inviting all of us to write a check to St. Luke's in the name of the Red Cross, and we as a community will make a statement because we are powerful. Now, you yourself may feel overwhelmed. You yourself may feel weak, but together, Together, we're very powerful. Together, we can make this statement. Together, we can build this kingdom of God. And Jesus looked at them and said, you are rejecting the cornerstone. And I am the cornerstone that all of the kingdom of God is built on. You see, brothers and sisters, you are in possession of that cornerstone that will anchor you and that will make you strong and safe and secure. You see, brothers and sisters, you yourselves are a vineyard. You are in possession of that vineyard. You have a vineyard. Your health is a beautiful vineyard. Your mind is a beautiful vineyard. Your spirit is a beautiful vineyard. Now I pray for you. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, I pray for all of us spirits and souls in this room. I pray that you empower them, that you remind them of your love, that you hold them safely. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.